When I was a child, I used to watch these films. I don't think. Films about an evil force that rose to power and spread across Europe. Films about wicked and powerful men who believed that they were better than everyone else. Films about armies invading and occupying. Films about soldiers patrolling the streets and demanding your papers, please. Films about people who lived in terror, afraid to even whisper what they really thought. Films about ruthless men who abducted people from their homes and shipped them away to far off prison camps to die. As I grew up, I learned the history behind these films. In 1938, Adolf Hitler marched Nazi troops into Austria. Almost the whole world remained silent while Hitler annexed Austria. A few months later, the Nazis annexed the Sudetenland with the agreement and approval of the world. Then came Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, the first Nazi pogrom against the Jews. Today, we stand witness while the ideological children of Nazi Germany stage an annexation of their own. In India, the Rashtriya Swayamsevak Song, a fascist paramilitary inspired by the Nazis, has risen to power. The RSS has already conducted its own pogroms while the world stood silent. In 2008, they massacred Christians. In 2002, they slaughtered Muslims. Under the watch of Narendra Modi, thousands of Muslims were brutalized, gang raped, beaten to death, hacked to pieces, and burned alive by the RSS. The blood of these innocent victims continues to cry out from the ground for justice. Yet how was Modi punished for overseeing this pogrom? Instead of punishment, Modi was rewarded with the office of Prime Minister of India. Now, the RSS rules the roost. The RSS, <coughs> these people who believe that they are better than everyone else, has swept across India. Journalists have been assassinated. Minorities have been lynched in the street in broad daylight. Those who raise voices of dissent are seized and thrown behind bars. Under Modi's regime, writes Indian professor Anand Teltumde, the RSS has unleashed the Hindutva gangs to carry out its writs reminiscent of the black shirts of Mussolini and the brown shirts of Hitler. Three weeks ago, the world watched as the RSS implemented one of the top items on its agenda with the most grotesque and shameless tyranny imaginable. As Modi trashed the Indian constitution and tore up the contract between India and Kashmir, he marched tens of thousands of troops into that small northern region a region which is approximately the same size as Austria. 81 years after Hitler's Anschluss, Modi annexed Kashmir. Now, Kashmir bleeds as it suffers oppression like never before. Oppression is nothing new in Kashmir, a place which has a vast history of subjugation, enforced disappearances, staged encounters, mass rapes, massacres, and mass graves. A land where generation after generation of Kashmiris have grown up thinking that abnormal is normal. A land where the people live in fear. A land where ruthless men abduct people from their homes and take them away never to be seen again. The weight of oppression in Kashmir is illustrated by the life and death of Jalil Andrabi. Andrabi, a Kashmiri human rights attorney, wanted to warn the world. Andrabi said, 
the magnitude of the atrocities and the crimes being perpetrated on the people of Kashmir is both macabre and heartbreaking. Andrabi reported more than 40,000 people have been killed, which includes all, old men and children, women, sick, and infirm. The youth of Kashmir have been mowed down. They are tortured in torture cells. And as a result of this, thousands of youth have been killed in police custody. But what happens? What happens to human rights activists in Kashmir? What happens to Andrabi? In 1996, days before he was scheduled to speak at the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva, Andrabi was abducted by the Indian Army. 20 days later, his body tied up in a sack, washed ashore on the Jolan River. His hands were tied behind his back. His eyes were gouged out. And his facial bones were crushed. He had been killed with a gunshot to the head. That was over 20 years ago, when Kashmir still had constitutionally guaranteed autonomy. That was before Modi, and that was before the annexation that took place on August 5th. Since the annexation, Modi's regime has dropped an iron curtain over Kashmir. His regime has mass arrested the entire civil society of Kashmir. Politicians, both mainstream and separatists, religious leaders, businessmen, heads of industry, teachers, academics, activists, teenagers, and even children as young as 10 or 11 years old. These people are seized without arrest warrants, they're held without charges, they are not brought to they are not brought to trial. They can't be because they're not being charged with anything. And many of them have even been shipped away to far out prisons outside of Kashmir. The situation is not much better for those who have not been arrested. For three weeks, for three weeks, Kashmir has been under siege. The whole region is under curfew, as people are forbidden to leave their homes. Kashmiris are living in an open-air prison. Under Modi's regime, the entire Kashmir has been turned into a massive concentration camp. But perhaps the greatest atrocity of all, and I know many of you are experiencing this right now, is the communications blackout. Since 5 August, Kashmiris all around the world have been denied the ability to contact their loved ones back home. Even just to ask, however briefly, are you alive? This is mental torture. As Modi conducts his monstrous colonial project, many Kashmiris fear that India wants the land of Kashmir without the people of Kashmir. Meanwhile, Kashmiris are muzzled. They are suffocated, unable to find any room to breathe as the boot of oppression presses down upon their throats. Some people say that the Kashmir issue is a bilateral issue between India and Pakistan. Some people say that the issue is an internal affair of India. I say that the issue is one of Kashmiris and what they want for Kashmir. Kashmiri voices and Kashmiri voices alone are the voices which matter when deciding the future of Kashmir. Thank you. Very beautiful. Beautiful. Kashmiris have been rendered voiceless by oppression. So today, I stand here in protest to demand that the voices of Kashmir be restored. To those who refuse to raise their voices for the voiceless, I say, silence is consent. 56 years ago, 
the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. sat writing a letter in the Birmingham, Alabama jail. He wrote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. 73 years ago, a German pastor wrote words that were very similar. Pastor Martin Niemöller, after surviving a Nazi concentration camp, wrote, First, they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Speak out for Kishmeyer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.